I'm going to talk about rational curves and contraction loci on holomorphic symplectic manifolds. Uh, so uh, let's start with X, a projective K3 surface. Uh, then we want to understand, let's say, the ample cone of X. And it's well known since Patsetsky, Shapiro, and Shafarevich uh, that a class alpha in the real neuron severity group of X is ample if and only if uh, it is of positive self intersection and is positive on all minus two curves. What is a minus two curve? This is a smooth rational curve in X, and of course, by adjunction formula, its square is minus two. An analogous result is also true in the killer case. So, in this case, we are considering a class. Uh, in H11R rather than in uh, the neuron severity, uh, and uh, then it is scalar if and only if it is of positive self intersection and is positive on all minus two curves. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is due to Loy and Hein Peters. Uh, so, in other words, we can say that the orthogonals to minus two curves bound the ample or the killer cone inside the positive cone. So here I drew some picture. This round thing is the positive cone on which we are looking from above. So I mean, we don't see the vertex and the origin. We see some kind of a transversal section. Uh, and then there are a few hyperplanes. Uh, so this hyperplane is an orthogonal to the class of a minus two curve. This also and this also, they bound the killer, uh, the ample cone, let's say, if we are in the projective setting or the killer cone in the non projective setting. And then I drew a few other hyperplanes. These are orthogonals to other classes of square minus two but maybe they are not represented by a smooth rational curves, uh, curve. Maybe they are represented by some reducible curve or uh, are not effective at all. Well, we know that plus or minus D is effective, but of course we don't know plus or minus. So uh, we can also reformulate this by saying that minus two curves are extremal curves extremal curves, I mean, in the cone of curves. Uh, and when we say extremal curve, we of course expect to say extremal contraction somewhere. Uh, and indeed, in this situation, we know that these minus two curves can be contracted to double points uh, in the projective as well as in the analytic setting. So we would like to study this in higher dimension. Uh, let's look at higher dimensional analogs of K3 surfaces. These are irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds, IHS manifolds. Uh, these are compact scalar manifolds, which are simply connected and uh, such that the space of holomorphic two forms on X is generated by a single element, which is symplectic. Symplectic means, of course, nowhere degenerate. So, in particular, the dimension of such as an X is even, and the canonical class is trivial. Uh, and uh, the uh, most specific feature which uh, permits to look at them as uh, like higher dimensional relatives of K3 surfaces is what one calls the bovil bogomolov form. Uh, this is a bilinear form, quadratic form, on H2XZ, which is integer valued, and it is of signature 3B2-3. And on H11, the signature is 1B2-3. Uh, so uh, it is exactly 
the same as it should have been for an intersection form on a surface. Uh, the only difference is that in general it is not unimodular. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, actually, the most studied example of uh, uh, irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds. Now let's take a K3 surface and consider X, which is uh, the nth punctual Hilbert scheme of S. Uh, so we uh, parameter subschemes of length n. Uh, then we have the Hilbert Chow morphism P from the Hilbert scheme of S. Uh, parameterizing subschemes to the symmetric nth power of S parameterizing cycles. Uh, so we map each subscheme to its support. And this map has an exceptional divisor, which we call E. It contracts precisely onto the diagonal, which is uh, the double point locus of the symmetric uh, power. Uh, so uh, uh, the class of this divisor is actually divisible by two in the Picard group uh, and uh, we call the small e uh, the half of the big e in the Picard group. Then we have the following isomorphism. H2 of x, z is isomorphic to the direct sum of H2 of s and of the well cyclic submodule generated by this E. And uh, the bouville bogomolov form is just the intersection form on H2. Uh, and then uh, the direct sum is orthogonal and E squared Q of E is 2 minus 2n. So 2 minus the dimension of x. Uh, and let's remark here that the embedding of H2 of S to H2 of X is given as follows. Uh, so let's say on algebraic cycles, we take a curve C, well, its class in H2, uh, and it's sent into uh, the divisor of subschemes which have some support on C. So let's say generically one point is on C and another point is arbitrary on X if we are talking about HILP2, let's say. Okay. A general remark. Uh, throughout this talk, uh, I will talk about classes of curves in H2 x q which is uh, a bit strange but uh, it's extremely convenient uh, you see thanks to the boville bogomolo form we can consider classes of curves as uh, classes in the second cohomologies with rational coefficients the h lower to xz becomes an over lattice of h to h well upper to xz and this is what we are going to do throughout this talk. Uh, so uh, we are going to talk about boville bogomolov squares of curves, and these will be rational numbers. Uh, so what are the questions which are preoccupying us here? The first question is uh, to describe the Keller or the ample cone of an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. Uh, to this effect, there is a theorem which is known since uh, many years already by Hoibrecht and Buxon, uh, which says uh, that uh, we have a very similar characterization of the Keller classes or the Ample classes. Uh, so a positive class is Keller if and only if it's positive on all rational curves. Uh, so exactly as in the case of surfaces, the orthogonals to rational curves bound the Keller cone. Uh, but now, back then we knew that they, these were minus two curves. Uh, and now, of course, uh, one can ask whether we have any bounds on the boville bogomolov squares of these curves. So in the K3 case, it was just minus two. 
if x is arbitrary, uh, then it turns out that bounds exist uh, and depend only on deformation type of x. This is something which we approved with uh, Verbitsky uh, around 2015. This is uh, essentially equivalent to the uh, morrison kavamata cone conjecture. Uh, and, uh, uh, but of course, it does not give uh, an explicit bound. I mean, we don't know anything about families of uh, irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds. We have uh, a few examples, and then we don't have any clue whether there are other examples or not. Uh, so, of course, these are not explicit bounds. It's just an existence statement. Uh, but in uh, in the examples, uh, there are then explicit bounds. Uh, so for Hilbert schemes of K3 surfaces, or more generally for X, which was deformation equivalent to such a Hilbert scheme, uh, there is a result by Bayer, Hassett, and Schinkel also from 2015, or maybe a bit earlier. I mean, 2015 is probably the publication year. Uh, and uh, this says that uh, it is sufficient to take, well, uh, rational curves with Beville Bogomolov square greater or equal than minus n plus 3 over 2. Well, a posteriori, I, I think it implies that uh, all rational curves are like this, but uh, in any case, well, we know that these extremal curves uh, have the uh, Beville Bogomolov square, uh, which is greater or equal than minus n plus 3 over 2. Uh, and in fact, yes, maybe it is useful to remark the following thing. Uh, if you have a K3 surface with a rational curve uh, inside, uh, then when you take the Hilbert scheme of such a K3 surface, uh, well, if your rational curve was smooth, uh, you will have a Lagrangian Pn inside this Hilbert scheme. This is just to the symmetric power of this p1 that you had on your original k3 surface uh, and then if you take for c a line in this p1 then it's not difficult to compute and it was done by Hasset and Schinkel for instance uh, that uh, uh, the Beville Bogomolov square of such a c is exactly minus n plus 3 over 2 so for Hilbert square it's minus 5 half uh, so uh, this is what where the bound is coming from. This is the square of uh, the class of a line in a Lagrangian PN. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so other questions. Uh, on a K3 surface, these minus two curves could be contracted. Uh, so we can ask, we may ask, what is the case in higher dimension? Can we contract these extremal rational curves? Uh, if X is projective, then it is very well known since uh, the 80s that yes, we can. Uh, if we have such an extremal rational curve, so uh, the orthogonal to its class gives a wall of the ample cone, uh, then uh, on this wall, there are some rational classes. Uh, those are the classes, well, up to, uh, if you make it integer, uh, these are the classes of NAF and big line bundles. Uh, and uh, by Kavamata base point free theorem, you know that such a class is semi ample. I mean, maybe this deserves a few words of explanation. So uh, uh, the class on such a wall is in the closure of the ample cone, so it is nav, and then it is big because it has positive square. It's just Hodge index theorem. Uh, well, 
No, it's not Hochi index theorem. It's rather by definition. Okay, by definition, uh, we are looking at positive classes, so it has positive boogie boogie square, and then it is an F, so it is automatically big, and then it's semi ample by Kavamata base point three, uh, and uh, uh, the corresponding morphism contracts uh, contracts uh, the C the curve C and and all its deformations and all uh, curves whose cohomology class is proportional to C and only that. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing which has become clear only recently is that this is also the case when X is arbitrary, when X is non-projective. And uh, maybe I shall not uh, talk about this in uh, much detail, but I will just remark that this follows from a work by Becker and Len in 2016. What they proved is that uh, if you can contract such an extremal ray, well, in the projective case, for instance, you can contract such an extremal ray C, uh, then you can also contracted on all the neighbors of X, well, on all the small deformations of X, where the corresponding class, well, the class of C, of course, survives. Uh, so uh, this is what they proved, and uh, then uh, uh, you somehow have to pass from local to global. I mean, now you, uh, well, you proved that you uh, can do uh, such a contraction in a small neighborhood of some projective manifold, uh, but then you can use uh, ergodicity theorem by Verbitsky to uh, pass uh, from this local setting to the global setting. Uh, if you have some deformation, some non-projective deformation xt, which is far away, then you use the monodromy group action to bring it into uh, a small neighborhood of your projective X. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so this, this is for the contractibility question. Uh, then we'd like to know how does the exceptional set look like? Uh, how does the exceptional set look like? So it was just one rational curve on a K3 surface. Of course, it's much more complicated uh, in a higher dimensional setting. Uh, what we uh, know a priori about those exceptional sets, about, well, let's say more generally about uh, some varieties covered by rational curves, we know the following thing. We know that if you take a minimal rational curve, I mean, minimal in the sense that you cannot bend and break it, that it is, uh, well, minimal among the rational curves in this uniroot sub-variety they cover. We know that it deforms in a family, well, inside X, it deforms in a family of dimension exactly 2n minus 2. Uh, well, which you can expect, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, that sometimes those minimal rational curves cover unirule divisors, for instance, the exceptional divisor of the Hilbert Chow morphism. So, if you want them to cover a sub variety of uh, dimension 2n minus 1, of course, the uh, dimension of the family is probably 2n minus 2. Uh, but not all unirule sub varieties of X are divisors, and not all exceptional sets are divisors. Uh, it can happen, of course, that the co-dimension is straight, strictly greater than one, uh, and then there will be just more minimal rational curves through a general point. But I'll come to this in a moment. Uh, next remark is that such a rational curve deforms outside of X together with its cohomology class. Uh, this is also something which has been exploited in many papers already, uh, 
uh, and it's something specific for hyperkiller manifolds. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, a little bit about the geometry of um, of the unirolled uni loci. Um, well, let's say that, let's suppose that they are already this exceptional loci for simplicity, that they are already contractible. Um, then you have the codimension, which as I said, can be greater than one. Well, you can have Lagrangian uh, PNs, for instance, as we have already noticed. Uh, so the codimension is exactly equal to the relative dimension of the rational quotient. So what is the rational quotient? This Z is fibered. Well, in general, it's uh, only rationally fibered. Uh, in some rationally connected manifolds over a non unirolled base, uh, and then those rationally connected manifolds have the dimension which is exactly the same as the codimension of Z. Uh, so if Z is a divisor, then Z is generically a P1 bundle. If Z is of codimension 2, then uh, you have a vibration uh, in uh, rationally connected surfaces, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, if uh, your Z is not just a general sub variety, but uh, an exceptional locus of a contraction, uh, then uh, these fibers, so these rationally connected fibers, are exactly the fibers of the contraction, of course. Uh, so, in particular, this rational quotient vibration is really a, a regular vibration, uh, and uh, uh, the fibers are of the contraction are rationally connected maximal rationally connected sub varieties uh, so uh, how about a more concrete shape of those exceptional loci in the examples uh, back around the year 2000 Hassett and Chinkel conjectured a precise description of the extremal rays and corresponding contraction loci on uh, Hilbert schemes of K3 surfaces. Uh, well, first on, let's say, low dimensional Hilbert schemes, Hilb2, Hilb3, and so on, and there are deformations, which are called irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds of K3 type, so deformations of Hilb n of K3. Uh, so let's look at first at Hilp 2 of a K3 surface. Uh, so let S be a K3 surface and suppose that there is some minus two curve C on this S. Then of course you immediately see a few unirule submanifolds of the Hilbert square of, of the Hilbert square of S. This Hilbert square of S. And then you immediately see three types of rational curves on the Hilbert square. Uh, three types of rational curves, let's say with negative Bovil Bogomorov. You have those, uh, well, these exceptional curves of the, uh, well, uh, sorry, uh, contracted curves of the Hilbert Chow map, you have this ruling of the exceptional divisor of the Hilbert Chow map, and uh, it's uh, quite easy to compute that the class in H2 is E over 2, so it's uh, the diagonal over 4, and the Boville Bogomorov square is, of course, minus one second. Then you have, um, uh, then you have these uh, lines in the Lagrangian P2, which uh, I also have said a few words about already. So you have C squared, lying and S squared. And C squared is just P2. Uh, and C1 is a line in this P2. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, you can compute that the Bouville book of square of this is minus five seconds. And then you have this C2 which is the ruling of the corresponding divisor. So you have the divisor of the sub schemes with some support on C, because generically it's a P1 bundle, but it's quite singular. 
uh, and uh, then you see that uh, this Q of C2 is, it's in fact an integer class, not just a rational class, and it's, it's Q is minus two. Uh, well, let's remark that C2 in fact is not an extremal rate. If you contract this C2, you contract DC, you contract C1 at the same time. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's not really an extremal ray, but it becomes an extremal ray after a flop. Uh, and so Hasset-Chinkin have conjectured that there are only three types of extremal rays as above and uh, the, uh, well, boville bogomorov squares are as above and the geometry uh, of uh, the exceptional says to that in those two uh, in, the, in two of the cases, it's generically a P1 bundle over a K3, uh, and uh, in one of the cases, it's a Lagrangian P2. So uh, here I have just written it down. So uh, there are three types of extremal rays. It can be integer or half integer of square minus two or minus one second. Then the exceptional set is generically a P1 bundle over a K3, or it can be, well, also half integer with boville bogomolov square minus five seconds, and then the exceptional set is the Lagrangian P2. And they had analogous conjectures for n equal to three and so forth. Uh, what is a bit striking is uh, that um, it does not seem to me to have been completely proved before the famous very difficult, very uh, general work by Bayer and McGree, who described the ample cone of uh, such Hilbert schemes of K3 in all dimension in terms of the Mukai lattice. Uh, and for this description, they used, uh, well, uh, many uh, uh, advanced, much advanced theory about moduli spaces of uh, sheaves on K3 surfaces, uh, very difficult computations, and uh, uh, well, this fairly recent notion of uh, stability conditions of on uh, triangulated categories. Well, all of this is clearly out of our scope here. What I would like to say, what is uh, the purpose of this talk, in fact, uh, well, uh, I would like to sketch an easy approach, an easy self-contained approach in low dimensions. And this approach is based on deformations to the non-projective case. Uh, so I am trying to explain to you today how to obtain a classification of extremal rays and their contraction loci on say HILP2 or HILP3 of a K3 or, well, or deformations, of course, on many folds, on four folds and six folds of K3 type. Well, eight fold and 10 fold is a K2. I think the computation is exactly the same. After that, it gets more complicated, but maybe something can be done in a uh, in, an, in a fairly easy and self-contained way. <clears throat> so based on deformation two, I am sorry, it's on the next slide, to the non-projective case. So if I talk about deformations, maybe I have to say a few words on the parameter spaces. <clears throat> I will be really very, very brief about that. Uh, maybe not very rigorous, uh, but all this can be done. Uh, so, uh, what are our favorite parameter spaces? I forgot to tell you that <clears throat> all this is based on a joint work with uh, uh, Misha Verbitsky. Uh, so, uh, favorite deformation spaces are as follows. We take the underlying differentiable manifold M, so we had uh, this holomorphic symplectic X, we take the underlying differentiable manifold M, uh, and uh, we consider the Teichmüller space, which is uh, the space of all complex structures, well, Keller complex structures, uh, modulo the action of uh, isotopies. 
Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, we abuse notation somewhat. Uh, I am speaking about the straight Muller space, but it can have many connected components, even infinitely many connected components. Uh, and we just take one. We just take one which contains our favorite complex structure X. We look at deformations on of X in this sense. Uh, and then there is the monodromy group acting on this tag. This is part of the mapping class group which fixes this component. Uh, and then uh, there are a few subspaces of the tag. Uh, we consider the part where a given class in the second cohomology remains of type 1-1. One, one. Uh, so, mostly we think about a class of an extremal rational curve in some complex structure. So, let's say it's a negative uh, class, which is represented by a rational curve in some complex structure. Uh, then, uh, well, this Teich Z, uh, you know, these Teich Muller spaces are usually non separated. Uh, this Teich is separated at a general point. But Teich Z is, in fact, not separated even at a general point. It falls naturally in two halves. And uh, there is one half of it, well, which is already separated at a general point, uh, Teich Z plus. Uh, this is the locus where Z is positive on Keller classes. Uh, and uh, in this type Z plus, uh, there is type Z minimal. Uh, this is the locus where Z orthogonal contains a wall of the Keller cone, supports a wall of the Keller cone, let's say. So this is the locus which really is interesting for us. This is the deformation space where uh, our class of an extremal rational curve remains a class of an extremal rational curve. Well, I have told you already that rational curves have tendency to deform together with their cohomology class, but of course, uh, sometimes uh, they may cease to be extremal, but we consider the locus where they don't. And it turns out, so it's Verbitsky's Torelli theorem, uh, that this type, well, it is non-separated, but if we glue together all inseparable points, it becomes the same the same thing as the period domain. So the period map from type to the period domain, well, the period domain uh, is exactly uh, the same thing as it is for K3 surfaces. So these are uh, lines in uh, H2, lines L such that Q of L is zero, but Q of L, L bar is positive. Uh, so it's an open subset of a quadricon here. This is the period domain. You may, of course, do the same for uh, hyperkeller. Uh, the period map is uh, the same. It sends a complex structure into its H to zero. Uh, so uh, uh, Torelli theorem says uh, that it's an isomorphism up to glue and separable points. Uh, then, uh, well, type Z is, of course, well, the space where Z remains of type of, uh, sorry, of type 1, 1. Uh, this is Z orthogonal. Orthogonal in the sense of the boville bogomolov form. So here you have, uh, uh, well, you don't really have boville bogomolov form of the, on the projectivization, but it does make sense to speak about the orthogonal. So this is the... <clears throat> inverse image of uh, uh, Z orthogonal, which, uh, well, I will just write Z orthogonal in Teich. I will omit uh, this period minus one most of the time. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in some, well, Teich Z plus is just one half of this Teich Z. So in fact, uh, uh, if you want, uh, well, this type Z is not separated even it's at its gen generic point, but you can split them in two and, well, this type plus Z is one half. Uh, so this is also, well, the period map from type plus Z to uh, the period domain is also uh, 
an, an isomorphism modulo gluing inseparable points. Uh, and uh, a somewhat surprising thing, but uh, well, it becomes obvious when you think about it, but uh, when you don't, it looks surprising, is that the same is true for Teich Min. Uh, that is to say, of course, our extremal rational curve Z may cease to be extremal under a deformation, uh, but in fact, you can pick up a point which is inseparable in the Teichmuller space of this point where it ceased to be extremal, such that at this point it is still extremal. See, if it's not extremal anymore in some complex structure I prime, then you have an I second unseparable, not separated from I prime, such that Z uh, is still represented by an extremal rational curve on I second. Okay, so this is the picture to have in mind. Uh, and uh, with uh, Misha, we proved the following theorem. Uh, here I am omitting a few assumptions like B2 greater than 5, I think. So I'm not completely rigorous, but uh, roughly what we proved is that if you have two complex structures in this tag that mean, so that is represented by an extremely rational curve on the two of them, uh, and uh, uh, then the corresponding contraction loci are diffeomorphic, uh, even real analytically isomorphic. So, I mean, Z is an extremal ray on both, so both have some extremal contraction uh, associated to Z, uh, and then uh, uh, the contraction loci are diffeomorphic and in fact fibers of the contraction, well, this maximal uni root, uh, sorry, not uni root, but rationally connected subvarieties of the contraction loci are even isomorphic whenever normal. Uh, so they look, well, the corresponding exceptional loci look very much the same. Of course, we cannot say that they are isomorphic, right? Because it's even not true in the simplest example. Uh, let's uh, uh, consider Hilbert squares of K3 surfaces, uh, then of course uh, there is a contraction locus where, which is just uh, the exceptional divisor of the Hilbert Chow map. Uh, it is a P1 bundle over our original K3, so if we deform K3, of course uh, this exceptional divisor, divisor deforms too. Uh, but uh, uh, of course they remain in the same uh, diff diffeomorphism class and uh, the fibers of the contractions are just P1, so they are isomorphic. Okay, uh, so uh, we proved that if you deform X, then the exceptional locus deforms in a way, in well, as nicely as possible. Okay, now uh, let's describe the extremal rays and the contraction loci on a Hilbert square. Uh, how are we going to do this? We are going to deform our X, let's say a, a, a irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds of K3 type, we are going to deform it to something which is very non-projective. Uh, we are going to deform it to something which is actually a Hilbert scheme of a non-projective surface, non-projective K3. Uh, so, uh, and then using the fact that the exceptional locus remains more or less the same under deformation, we of course are going to draw a conclusion to which is well that uh, Hassett and Schinkel's theorem, uh, sorry, conjecture, which now is a corollary of Bayer Macri's machinery, but uh, this is of course a much more self-contained way to do it. Uh, so, um, 
uh, let's look at the Teichmüller space for X. So I drew this Teichmüller space, a component of the Teichmüller space. Uh, and then uh, in this Teichmüller space, you can see the uh, locus of uh, complex structures which are actually Hilbert schemes uh, of a K3 surface. Uh, so H2 of X is H2 of S plus E, right? Plus Z times E, where E is half of the diagonal. Uh, let's say, well, uh, now we don't have this Hilbert scheme structure uh, on all X, but we still have a class. So H2 of X is a, a constant under the deformation. So, uh, Let's take this class E, which is uh, the uh, this exceptional class of the Hilbert Chow eh, on in some complex structures, uh, and uh, then uh, then uh, uh, it has uh, monodromy images gamma of E, uh, and in fact uh, the uh, deformations of X, which actually are Hilbert schemes, are exactly the complex structure in which sum of gamma of E is, is of type 1, 1. So either E itself or its monodromy transforms are of type 1, 1. Uh, then you have this exceptional divisor of the Hilbert Chow map and you have the Hilbert scheme structure on your deformation X. Uh, X prime. Uh, so uh, let's say we are we want to describe uh, we want to describe negative rational curves. Uh, so let eta be the class of an extremal rational curves of an extremal rational curve, uh, and then the uh, complex structures where eta remains of type 1, 1, where this rational curve survives, well, this is eta orthogonal. And of course, it intersects some of those hyper, well, uh, the hyperplanes, uh, gamma of E orthogonal. Uh, what we claim, well, this is particular to the case of the Hilbert square. What we claim is that we can find a gamma such that the vector space generated by eta and gamma of E is actually negatively definite with respect to the boville bogomolov form. Uh, so this is eta, this is such a gamma of E, and I am deforming my complex structure I to some generic, well, general point in the intersection. What is the general point of the intersection? It corresponds to a complex structure with Picard rank equal to two. The Picard, Picard group of a general deformation like this is generated by eta and gamma of E. So I know that this is the Hilbert scheme of a K3 surface and that the boville bogomolov form is negatively definite. So I know that this K3 surface is non-projective and it has cyclic Picard group with negative square of the generator. So my X prime, well, it's like this, right? Uh, and uh, so on such an X prime, I have, of course, very, very few rational curves. Uh, on S, I only have, maybe I don't have rational curves at all. Maybe I have a single, single rational curve C in this class X. Well, Q of X is then, of course, equal to minus two, okay? Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's easy to see that the rational curves on X prime are actually coming from the ruling of this exceptional divisor. This is always present. And then when there is such a C, uh, such a minus curve C on S, uh, then we may consider also rational curves which are coming from this C. 
uh, that's to say a line in uh, the corresponding Lagrangian plane, uh, the symmetric square of C, and uh, uh, and uh, well, I have been too fast, mm, and uh, this other um, uh, this other uh, C two. I think we have been calling this C two. Uh, the C2, which is the ruling of the divisor of GC, consisting of sub schemes with some support on C. Okay. Uh, so we have exactly three types of rational curves on X prime. Uh, of course, uh, at um, at a generic point, not all of them are extremal rational curves. Now, we have already seen that C2 is not an extremal rational curve, it becomes an extremal rational curve after a flop, uh, but there is nothing more. So, we have proved this hazard chinkers classification in this case. Now, what happens if we increase this n? For n equal to 3, it's not true anymore that we can find a gamma of E such that eta and gamma of E generate a negative vector space. Uh, well, on which the Boville Bogomolo form is negative definite. Uh, but we can find a gamma of E such that this subspace is Boville Bogomolo negative semi definite. Uh, and then x deforms to help n of s, uh, where s is a k3 surface with cyclic Picard group generated by x, and uh, the bovil pogomol square of x is negative or zero. Uh, then, well, in the case q of x is negative, we have same rational curves as above, but now there are more types because we will also. Uh, have the unirule sub varieties which consist of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, all uh, uh, well, generically uh, a generic point of such a unirule sub variety that would cor correspond to uh, a sub scheme where two points are on C and so on. You see, uh, so there are n plus one types of extremal rays of potential extremal rays coming from, uh, well, arising in the same way as in the previous case, uh, on uh, arising from this rational curve C, which can exist on X, uh, and then in the case where Q of X is zero, what does it mean? It, it means that S has an elliptic pencil and no other curves. Uh, so, uh, then we get a few more type. Uh, in fact, uh, if you check it, uh, then you see that sometimes you find the old types back. So, in particular, when n is equal to 3, uh, then uh, you get exactly one more type of rational curves from this situation. Uh, in fact, uh, the minimal rational curve uh, uh, let's call it D to uh, stress so that it's not the same type as uh, those C's we had above. It comes from uh, the linear system G12 uh, on the fibers of this map. You see fibers are elliptic curves. If you look at Hilbert, Hilbert power, uh, then, uh, well, let's say Hilp. Uh, help two, uh, then you have uh, rational curves which are G12 on the fibers, but you always also have uh, those rational curves in all higher Hilbert powers. In Hilp three, you also have such rational curves. You just fix the third point, and then the first two points uh, they are running through this G12 on a fiber of this map. Uh, so uh, uh, this type is. Uh, really different from those 
uh, arising in the case n equal to 2. Uh, and you have, uh, in the same way, you have a few more types uh, in the case n is 4 or 5. <clears throat> this proposition unfortunately holds only for n up to 5. Uh, after this, uh, you don't, you cannot always deform to this negative semi-definite uh, case. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, this approach could uh, give some uh, uh, elementary information uh, in a, a higher dimension as well. Uh, okay, so I think I am ready. 